All right, welcome to IS50B, which is second semester game development. Woo! And so this uh, this class is more programming oriented than the other one. In IS50A, I do blueprints. I don't want to scare off people, especially people that haven't really programmed before. This class, there will be more programming. The programming should not be hard per se, but there will be programming. And the um, and, and that's honestly one of the biggest differences between 50A and 50B is that you're going to actually get into like game programming and like computational geometry stuff, which is actually a lot of fun. Um, computational geometry allows you to do things like uh, input a 3D model and eliminate triangles that are redundant. And I don't know if you guys, can you guys guess why that would be useful? Like if I have a model here of some vitamin D supplements and there's a billion triangles in it and I could reduce it down to a thousand without much loss of quality. Do you guys understand why that would be useful in a video game? Surprisingly small class for game design. The IS50 class is big, um, but 50B has never had that many students in it. Last semester we had three or four. I don't think Walker actually registered, but he was hanging out with us. Uh, Bell was hanging out. He had already graduated. Um, and all of the students dropped. So I was like giving homework assignments and then just like all three students dropped um, at the beginning, like the first couple weeks of class. I'm like, okay, well, I guess I don't have to prep IS50B now. You know, that's nice. But um, it, it's, you know, it, I was excited for it. So um, I've done the Blender bit. You can bake smaller poly models with fake details. Yeah. So the, um, uh, it, it's called decimation, right? And so that that's a very obvious um, need, which is if I'm rendering this with a billion triangles and your GPU does, let's say, a billion triangles a second, you will get one frame a second rendering this thing. Bloop, bloop, bloop. And that's assuming you have nothing else in the world whatsoever. You will eat up your entire triangle budget with just one pill bottle, which you could probably approximate uh, very, very... Um, easily right and so if you were able to cut it down to a thousand triangles which is still you know not insignificant uh, you can still probably get you, you see how the highlights on it are, are nice and smooth and things like that uh, when you have a round plastic bottle those getting those specular highlights um, you, do you guys see that does that does that come through on the on the video specular highlighting there uh, the mat, the top is kind of matte. Matte means it's not really reflective. It's a little shiny. You see that? Top's a little bit shiny. But that shiny plastic surface, uh, it's really important to get it right, you know, or, or it'll, you know, look bad. And so if you're able to run a computational geometry program and you could reduce your triangles from a billion to a thousand, your frame rate will go up by a factor of like uh, a million, right? And so, uh, Unreal Engine 5 is apparently going to have some sort of system like that automatically built in, which is pretty cool. Uh, basically, it'll stream in more detail. So if you get really up close to the bottle, it'll, it'll on the fly stream in the high res stuff. But even still, you probably don't want to write to disk a billion triangles because that's just going to eat it like your hard drive space is going to be like that's a gigabyte of data, right? For one model, right? <laughs> which is probably insignificant, right? So, uh, and so there's there's lots of tricks that we use in game development to, to do that, where you decimate, um, you decimate a model, and then if there's certain detail on it, like the writing on top of this here, you could approximate that using um, triangles, but it's probably waste, right? Because you can't really, you know, you, you, so what they'll do a lot of times is they'll essentially take a picture of it, right? And then they'll they'll knock out all of those triangles, make it a flat surface, which is like I don't know, a couple triangles, whatever. And then they'll they'll take the picture of that of the words on top there, the push down to turn, and they will just make that a texture and just and then bake it on top, right? And then if you have a normal map, a normal map is like a texture. You you wrap it, you can apply it to a surface, and the normal map will say. 
if you guys remember what the normal is on a triangle, the normal is the direction perpendicular to the surface of the triangle. And so if you have a triangle here, the normal is at a 90 degree angle to it. And so that tells you which way is kind of the surface is facing, right? So the, the normal of my monitor is pointed straight at me. And so a normal map, if you bake that onto the surface of a triangle, uh, it can simulate the effect of something like this, where you've got a raised surface, not really raised, but like a little bit raised. And you see how the shadows are hitting it differently and the lights bouncing off the, the canyons and valleys differently. You can simulate all of that with just like two triangles and a normal map. And so it, it, there's a lot of tricks like that that we use to speed up video games because video games are all about the FIPS, man. You got, you got to get your FIPS going. You, you know, if you're not getting, if you're not getting a smooth frame rate, then your game's garbage. And if you're, if your frame rate dips, people, it takes, it jars you. It takes you out of, it takes you out of the, the game world and into the real world. And people don't like the real world, right? Like in cyberpunk, um, sometimes you'd go into an area and the frame rate would drop from, I was running on 4k, um, medium ray tracing most of the time. And so I was averaging about 48 frames a second or so. And then sometimes for unknown reasons, the frame rate would drop to 13 and I would immediately be aware that I was playing a video game and a very slow video game of that. And it was really annoying and it was completely unclear why the frame rate dropped. And so I would quick save, go to the start menu go back into the game and the frame rate would be up at about 50. And I'm like, it's the same scene, the same buildings. The NPCs are different because the NPCs are sort of dynamically generated. But like, why, why? It's just, I'm in the, I literally quick save and then reload and the frame rate goes from 13 to 50. And I'm like, and it's annoying to do that, right? Because you have to quit out and you have to reload and there's a loading screen. And doing that a couple times an hour in some areas of the city just got really annoying to me. So I ended up turning off uh, ray tracing for a while. With the ray tracing off, the frame rate didn't dip. The ray tracing makes the game look a lot better. So I kept going back and forth on whether or not I wanted to put up with these random frame rate drip dips or you know, play a game with reduced visual quality. And so that's, that's really one of your guiding principles in video game development is to have um, is to have those issues resolved before launch <laughs> CD Projekt Red before launch those things should be resolved <sighs> um, yeah we're not even going to talk about cyberpunk on console because that was just a train wreck of epic proportions right they're getting sued over it. Sony pulled it from the store, which I don't even remember the last time that happened. They pulled something from the store. Um, well, you learn how games display things, what's in camera view, and unload other things. Yeah. yeah. Learn that. So, um, it that that is something I want you guys to get into your heads like from the beginning, is that when you do things in video games, you always have to take into account your FIPS. Right? Like if you're gonna, if you're gonna write code that's gonna like iterate over every object in the world, and you're gonna do that every frame, you're not gonna have a good frame rate. Like it, it'll work fine for your little uh, toy, you know, world with like three boxes in it or something. But if you do that in a game like Cyberpunk, where there's who knows how many objects in the world, trillions maybe, I don't know, uh, your your frame rate will go to absolute hell. And so. Um, yeah, I mean, Fallout 76 is a disaster of epic proportions. Also, like, I actually don't hate Cyberpunk. Um, a lot of people are, like, just making a living crapping on it. You know, there's all these YouTube videos about how they betrayed us and all this stuff. And I'm like, the game was fine. Like, I would give it a B, you know? Like, um, it, it looks like Grand Theft Auto and plays like Grand Theft Auto, but it's really not a Grand Theft Auto game. Like, it's... I think it's just mostly a failure to manage expectations, right? Is that it's not really an open world game. Like you play the game, you've got a bunch of stories and the stories are really good. And so you just fast travel to the story, you play through the story, and then you fast travel to the next one. There's absolutely no reason to be driving around in the world. Sure, there's random events, but the random events are just cops shooting people mostly. 
And so, like, you don't really get anything for it experience, I guess. But it doesn't help you get an achievement or anything like that. So there's really no reason to um, experience the open world of Cyberpunk. By the end of the game, though, I was just kind of driving around because I just liked the world. And I was just, like, admiring the views. But, like, there would be a random event of a cop shooting some people. And I'd just drive by. It's like, whatever, you know. The cops in the game are dumb anyway. So um, Expectations were very high. I my my take on it before release was that Cyberpunk that CD Projekt Red was going to be the next Bethesda, and it turned out I was right. Except more on the bug side of things than the open world uh, side of things that I was expecting. But um, yeah, so yeah, Anthem Anthem bricked Playstations, and they didn't pull Anthem. So I don't know. Uh, uh, Anthem was a far worse. I mean, it's cyber like I don't. Know. Like, I was, I was just fine they released it because I'd waited long enough for it. And because they released it before winter break, I was able to play it all winter break. I put 150 hours into it, 100% of the game, and uninstalled it. And I'm happy they they didn't delete it anymore because I'd have to wait till summer, you know, to play it. Because I don't have that kind of time uh, during a semester. Okay. So, uh, so that that's one of our central theses this semester is how do you... Yeah, especially code wise, like how do you make sure your game is high frame rate? Okay, and so Sibelia was asking, um, how do you how do you discard geometry that is behind you? And so to answer that question, let's first talk about the basics. So uh, can you guys all log in? By the way, uh, let's let's uh, we we've done we've done this this math, this linear algebra, we did it in IS-50A. Did anyone here take IS-50A not with me? Because that will will change the lecture that I'm about to give. Did anyone take IS-50A not with me, like at CART? Because CART's been teaching 50A for a while. Um, Redownloaded New Vegas and had an amazing time. Yeah, follow New Vegas, which uh, was made by an acquaintance of mine. Oh, she was third on the credits. Um, it's a fantastic game. And I'm not saying that because she she was an acquaintance of mine, but um, I did bring her out here a couple of years ago to give a talk to my uh, game development class, and she gave an awesome speech, Tess Treadwell, although her name is now Tess Tappen, I believe. Uh, fantastic person, very brilliant, brilliant developer. Her title was like producer or something like that, some something along those lines. She's the, she's the third name. It's it'll say Tess Treadwell. John Treadwell was a friend of mine, and um, she married him. And uh, they divorced, and so she's remarried now. Um, so, yeah, so it's like Chris Avalon or something like that, and she's like the third on the credits list before. Where do you go to log in? Never done before. Ah, yes, okay. Uh, Rosenberg, have you ever done C++ programming before? So this will also change my... Uh, uh, just on your own? Okay. Tried so hard to like New Vegas, but the invisible walls pissed you off. Yeah, that's fair. Um... When I finished it, I, I messaged her, and she's like, how many bugs did you find? <laughs> you know. Um, and it, it was pretty buggy at release. Um, and that's something I think people forget when they're criticizing Cyberpunk 2077. Like, every Bethesda game, and, and Fallout New Vegas wasn't Bethesda per se. It was produced by Bethesda, but it was made by the people at, was it, Obsidian? Um, all of them are buggy. All these big open world games are buggy at launch. Kingdom Become Deliverance was incredibly buggy. There was this bug where guards would drop a halberd. Like they'd be walking around, and for whatever reason, they'd drop a halberd. And then the game would notice that the guard didn't have a halberd in their hand, so it would give them another one. And then they would walk, and then they'd drop it, and then it'd spawn another one. And so over time, the city streets would just be carpeted and thousands of halberds, and the frame rate would drop to like five. And you can't destroy them. You can't even, because halberds, you can't even put in your inventory. Um, you can carry them, but you can't actually put them in anything and you can't destroy them. And so you would, you could like move them. So you, so I'd run around after the guards picking up their halberds and like throwing them in an area that I didn't go to. And that area would have a frame rate of like one, you know, cause the guards are just littering halberds everywhere. Like, like people forget how buggy all of these big open game worlds are at launch. And Cyberpunk, I think, kind of got um, a little bit unfairly criticized for that. Okay. 
Uh, Obsidian's gay cowgirl Treadwell. Yeah, that's her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, people, yeah, and, and for those watching at home, that's literally what her credits say. It says Obsidian's gay cowgirl. So uh, that was not me casting shit at her. She's she's a really cool person. She's very smart, very good uh, game uh, developer. Okay, uh, write about little code words and stuff. Okay, so Rosenberg, uh, we'll need to partner you up with somebody then to do these. Anybody want to partner with Rosenberg on the assignments for the coding assignments? Any Anyone want to volunteer as tribute? Muya? All right. So Muya, uh, talk with Rosenberg, get him involved. Okay, so you got everybody else you're on the server. Not that you're reliable. Yeah. Um, Anyone else on, not on the server, I should say. You guys here? Collins, Mancarelli. All right, so let's, let's, let's do a little code. Let's do a little code, a little Cody code. Uh, so let's, let's talk about linear, let's talk about linear algebra, okay? So let's talk about struct uh, vec2 I know, I know int x y so you guys are all familiar with a 2D Cartesian plane, right? your standard, you know, 2D graph, you know, kind of thing are you guys familiar with like this kind of stuff? like a algebra 1 kind of stuff, right? and so Linear algebra is sort of the uh, the starting, the kicking off point for for a lot of stuff um, in in graphics. And um, now that you're liable, Cody code, what's that? Um, and so there's there's a lot of ways you can like um, do things. The um, your first homework assignment isn't going to require any linear algebra, so maybe maybe I should talk about that first. But what I'd like to do is like go over dot product and cross product in um, in code, right? Because these these are like your your building blocks of um, higher level stuff. Like if you want to backstab somebody, you can uh, take the dot product of the way they're looking, the way you're looking. You take the dot product and that gives you a number and then you use that number to determine if you're backstabbing them or not. And so we've done that in blueprints. Let's do it in code right now. So I'm just going to do 2D because 2D is easier to type than 3D, but it, same same principles apply. Okay. So um, float dot product, which will take in two vector twos. By reference, um, call it point one and point two. So we're going to take in two points, two vectors. Uh, you can think of uh, them as having. Um, you can think of them as being. Let's see. Uh, yeah, like this. Okay, so let's say we've got uh, vector one and vector two. I'll call I'll, you know what I'll even call them v one and v two. Let's let's just do it that way. Okay, vector one and vector two. And so I want to know if vector vector one, let's say, is the direction a guard is facing. And so we always assume in these kinds of things the origin of the vectors at zero zero at the origin, and and the direction we're looking is this way. And I want to know, uh, am I backstabbing him? Right? So I've, I've, uh, I've just done a trace line. Uh, I clicked attack. I shot a trace line out. I hit the guard. Okay? But I, don't, I need to know if I'm backstabbing the guard or if it should be a normal hit. Or maybe a side hit. Uh, I've been playing Fell Seal Arbiter's Mark recently. And it's got front attacks, side attacks, and back attacks. And it does so by looking at the angle of the way that the two people are facing. And um, 
And so if the guard's looking this way and I'm looking this way, that means it's probably like this. Like the guard's looking that way, I'm probably behind them. But you have to determine is that um, is that a backstab or not? And that's just a design decision you make. But let's talk about dot product. So how do we do a dot product? How do we do a dot product? And these will be floats or you know doubles. Why not? How do you do? How do you do a dot product? You know. Yeah, the, the two X components multiply by each other times the two Y components multiply each other. Uh, the trouble is, um, if they're not normalized vectors, then the length gets multiplied together as well. So the dot product will give you the, the, dot, the dot product will give you the length of vector one times the length of vector two times the cosine of theta, the angle between them. And we, we don't want the lengths multiplied in there, right? So we need to first normalize those vectors. And so how do you normalize a vector in code? So let's make a, let's make a void normalize vec2 by reference. So how do you normalize, how do you normalize a vector? So this fellow over here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. 11 across and 6 up, we need to normalize that down to a unit vector. We need to normalize it to be a vector of length 1. How do we do that? Is it just Muya who's live right now, or the rest of you guys dying? Or okay. So in order to normalize something, you have to know what the length of the vector is, right? And the length of the vector, double length, the length of the vector. In fact, we might even just make a length function, double length. Do you see how this, do you see what I'm doing here? So in order to figure out the dot product, you have to have a normalized function. In order to have a normalized function, you need a length function. What I'm trying to show you is that you, you kind of build up a collection of, of tools in your arsenal that you use to, to, to do this kind of coding. So the length of a vector uh, is the Pythagorean theorem, right? So if you have a vector like this that is three across and four up, the length is five. Three squared plus four squared, square rooted is five right? Pythagorean theorem. The length of a vector is equal to the x squared plus y squared square root. Okay, so uh, C++ has a function for that, which is called hypot. So you don't have to write the whole thing out yourself. Hypot of vx and vy. And so that will return the length of a vector. And then to normalize the vector, what you do is, uh, so if you have a vector that's like three across and four up, you uh, divide the x part by five because the length of the vector is five. So the x part goes from being three to three fifths. And the y part goes from being, the y component goes from being four to four fifths. And if you do the, the length of a three fifths and four fifths vector, you get one, which is what we want. So to normalize this, we say vector uh, let's see. Double L equals length of the vector. So we'll get the length of the vector, and then we'll say v dot x is divided by L, and v dot y is divided by L, and we will call it a day. So that will turn a vector into a unit vector, pointing in the same direction. So it'll be pointing in the same direction. So if we had a vector pointing this way, then it will shrink down to be a vector pointing in the same direction of length one. And the reason why we do this is because when we're gonna do the dot product, we don't want the dot product to have the magnitude of the vectors factoring into it. We wanna get a number between negative one and positive one. And so, um, uh, let's see here, returns negative one to positive one. Uh, one means they are pointed the same way. Zero means they are orthogonal to each other, i.e. 90 degrees. And negative one means they are pointed in opposite 
directions. So um, this is math, and I apologize. First day of class, you're, get, you're getting mathed. Uh, a lot of this is based on what I taught in IS58, um, but it's in C++, right? So, um, but this is a really good tool because like if you, let's say you do a trace line in your code, if you remember how you interact with the game world, you do trace lines a lot. You hit the use button, the use button will, will cast a ray out from your eye, uh, out to like whatever your arm length would be, probably a meter. It'll cast a ray out for a meter and whatever it hits, if that thing is marked as usable, then it will uh, maybe try using the thing. Like if there's a button in the world, it casts the ray out, it touches the button, and if the button is usable, which it probably is, then it will call the use function on it. The, the thing is though, like you don't want, like if you have a vending machine, you don't want to be able to activate the vending machine from the back side, right? And so it's very common you do a dot product. Is, is the vending machine facing me? The, the vending machine will have a vector pointed at me, I'll have a vector pointing at it. I call the dot product. Is the result negative? If it's negative, that means I'm to the front of it, looking at it, and then it'll activate the vending machine. Or you can make it so that you have to be like directly in front of it. So based on what number you pick, you could have like an entire 180 degree arc that can activate the vending machine, or you can make it like a 45 degree arc. So you have to be like mostly in front of it. Like you can't activate the vending machine from the side like this. Like you're an inch in front of it and you're like hitting it. You can you can restrict it to be, you know how whatever feels right in your game. Okay. Uh, dot product can't be const because normalize will change it. Yeah, good point. But um, we'll have to make a copy then because I, I I don't I don't think people would expect the dot product to uh, change the vector, right? So. Uh, we will make a copy like that, and then we will say normalize v1, yyp, normalize v2. So we're just going to copy them. And then, uh, so now that they're unit vectors, um, now we can we can do the dot product formula, which we had posted earlier, which is you multiply the x parts together, and you add the y part, you multiply the y parts together, and you add those two values together, and that's the dot product. So return v1.x times v2.x plus v1.y times v2.y. And so this will this will give you a number from one to negative one. And this is a very, very useful tool to have in your toolbox. I use it all the time. Okay. And then um, cross product, do you know what the formula for cross product is? So cross product normally returns a vector. Um, sometimes though you just want the magnitude of the vector right the length of the vector so um, we'll do that one and if we need if we need to get eh, if we need to get a vector we could do that okay so So there's, there's a way of doing it without doing any trig, right? So this is technically returning the cosine of the angle between them. Um, but we actually, do you notice how we didn't have any, we didn't have any trig. There's no trig called there. We're doing it purely algebraically, which is a lot faster. Trig functions are expensive. So do you guys know what the, uh, the code is for the magnitude of the cross product? I believe it's like the determinant of the function, something like that. It's been a while since I looked at it. I think it's like x x one y two minus x two y one. I think. Magnitude of a, magnitude of b times the sine of n sine theta. 
the normal vector. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, it's the determinant. Yeah, yeah, cool. I remember my linear algebra. I just want, these are 3D vectors, I want 2D vectors. Uh, let's see. Should I pause the streaming so I don't embarrass myself online? <laughs> I posted in chat, like you can't cross product in 2D because you get a 3D vector out. This is going to be in the the third dimension no we, we don't want a vector though we're just going to get we just want the magnitude yeah, yeah. so to do it you just have to solve that matrix that i put in by, uh, uh, the yeah there it is yeah determines. yeah okay there it is okay v1x no, yeah that's what i said <laughs> yeah it's perfect see my memory is perfect i don't know what you guys are talking about okay <laughs> v1x uh v1x v1.x times v2 dot y minus v2 dot x times v1 dot y. Right? Yes. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's what I, I usually use. Sometimes you do want to get the, the vector though because um, if you have like two, if you have like two vectors that make up a um, two legs of a triangle and you want to get the normal, that's the cross product and so you get a, a vector coming out that way. But for the uh, for the scalar version of it, where you just get um, the magnitude of it, there you go. Okay. And so let's do, what is the application of cross product again? Good question. So um, what if we want to find out if a point is to the right of a line? And this, this, will, be, this will be relevant, I promise. So the dot product is useful if you want to see if two guys are pointed the same way or if they're pointed perpendicular or if they're um, pointed in opposite directions. Cross product, let's, let's, let's make some examples. Let's make some examples. Um, oh, look at this, girl. Do you draw that? Look at that. You got better handwriting than me, maybe. No, not handwriting, but the art's definitely better. Did you do it in pencil first, then you inked it over? Actually, I just inked it. Oh. That's pretty cool. I know. This looks like a mutated... That's right. You want to color it? No. No? It's black and white only. Um, all right. So let's let's make some examples. Uh, so let's start off with um, a, a vector. Vec2 named um, um, XE. XE is going to be pointed to the right. And let's make a vec2 called y that is pointed up. These these two vectors are perpendicular to each other. Rosenberg, do you understand? Like I, I'm I'm trying not to be like really too technical. I'm just I'm I'm going over this math because it's actually going to be really relevant to to uh, what's that? Grandma? Play Skyrim. Yes, you can play Skyrim. So I I promise this will be relevant. Because uh, we're gonna be we're gonna be doing all sorts of interesting things. In this code. is for you. Oh, thank you, girl. Um. So, uh, if we see out the dot product, Rosenberg, you with me though, man? Are you here, Sam? I just want to make video games, man. Why are you? So if we output the dot product of two perpendicular vectors, it should be zero, right? Because zero means they're at 90 degrees to each other, right? And then if we do the cross product, nope, we get one. Now, what if we put uh, this guy as negative one? Can 
get negative one. Okay. All right. So cross product returns it's it's ninety degrees off from the other. I'll just give you the answer. It returns zero if the uh, two vectors are parallel in either direction. Like, so they could be facing each other or facing the same way. It doesn't matter. So if we like cross product XC and XC with itself, we get zero, right? And uh, so it doesn't matter if they're facing the same way or opposite ways, you, you get zero. And then you get, uh, what is it? Returns negative one if the second point or vector, whatever you want to call it, is to the left and returns one if the sec, no, other way around. Returns one if the second point is to the left and returns negative one if the second point is to the right. Okay, and so this, this is very useful. <laughs> Same, you know, same reason why the dot product is useful. You know what I mean? And so, um, uh, a lot of times you want to know if something's to your right or to your left, right? And so you you cross product them, and uh, and this doesn't even have to be with a look vector, right? Let's say that um, let's say that you're looking uh, at a forty five degree angle from the origin. Right, so let's uh, you know let's just name these things B1 and B2. Why not? Right, so let's say that we're looking at 45 degrees to the origin. So vector one is pointed at two two, so it's pointed it's pointed you know at a 45 degree angle coming up off the origin. You guys understand? And this this applies to 3D games too, but you know, so let's let's say. You're, you're driving a car, and the car is driving uh, in the direction that it's looking, and it's going at a speed of, you know, two in the x-axis and two in the y-axis, so the car is going at a 45-degree angle off that way. You guys with me so far? It's so like V1 is the, let's say, the velocity of your the car that you're driving. Okay, and let's say that you want to know uh, there's a pedestrian, right? So let's, let's, let's do this. So this is the velocity of your car and then this is the location of a pedestrian okay. the pedestrian is at um, 3 3 okay See if there's like an interactive Car Cartesian graph interactive website. I can draw this. Interactive Cartesian coordinates. Cool. Reset. Really? Okay, go away. Okay, so the car is traveling in this direction. It's traveling at 2, 2. And then we got a pedestrian up here at 3-3. Three, three. Are we going to run over the pedestrian? Yeah. So uh, I haven't really told you what the coordinate system is, but basically you would uh, you would subtract the location of the pedestrian from the car's location. So it would be, so the origin is the same. The, the car's position is the origin. And then you have the velocity and then you have location, which are two different things normally, but you can put them on the same graph. And, uh, and, and in fact, let's put it a little bit off to the side. I'm, in fact, I'll just use these numbers, okay? So, so the velocity that we're traveling in is uh, 1.95, 1.95. And the pedestrian is sitting pretty at 3.46, 2.87. So let's say that you're you're one of the developers at CD Projekt Red. You're making Cyberpunk, 
and you're writing their horrible AI code that determines if a pedestrian is about to be run over. So every pedestrian, probably every frame, is running this code. And all it has to do is a dot product. So you do a dot product between the velocity of the car and the position of the person. And if the number is close to zero, then uh, you, you, you're about to get run over. And you can do that with a dot product also, right? But um, cross product will tell you which way they should dive, right? Because if you're coming in, if, if they're off to the right, you want them to dive to the right instead of diving in front of you. You know what I mean? And so the dot product can also be used to determine if you're going to drive them over. But the cross product will, will be useful because if the sign is negative, that means they're off to the right and they should dive to the right. And if the sign is positive, then they're on the left-hand side and they should dive that way, perpendicular to your, to your velocity. Do you guys understand? Collision is dependent on how close to zero the developers want. Yeah. And so uh, basically you can tweak that number. And, and these are things that you just have to, um, you play the game. And if you, people, if you see people reacting like, oh my gosh, I'm going to get run over, which is how it is in Cyberpunk 2077, like it's really annoying. Uh, they, they freak out. Like if you're just driving down the street, they just freak, oh, he's going to murder us. And they start running and everyone starts cowering and panicking. It is garbage awful ai but like i said that's not we're not it, it's it's really not a grand theft auto type game it's really not about driving around the city having fun it's about the story you know but uh to be fair this is horrible and so uh let's let's put it on the other side so you can see we've got a uh Ooh, sorry all right so the uh the uh, car is driving in this direction. Now let's put the let's put the pedestrian over here. Okay, so he's off on the left hand side now. So 3.32, 4.4.2. 4 and you see it's a number close to zero, but it's positive this time. Because it's positive, that means it's on the left hand side. It's close to zero, which means you're in the path of the car, right? And and what you do, Sibelia, is you just probably set a threshold. Like if it's, you know, and, and you just probably play with it. Like, you know, this is probably off to the side, right? Because the car is moving in this direction. It's moving at a 45 degree angle. This guy's far enough, far enough off to the side. He's probably not going to get run over. And what you do is just plug some numbers in and kind of look at what feels about right for a guy like being like, oh, damn, I'm about to get run over, you know? And so you just, you just look at these different numbers that come out and, and then you also have to figure out how far away you want it to trigger. Cause if they're like on the other side of the map, you don't want them cowering. So it has to be within a certain, like the, the length of this vector has to be within a certain distance. And then the angle, the, the cross product has to be within like, let's say 0.2 or something like that. And then the, then the pedestrians like, ah, and then throws themselves out of the way. Uh, my friends and I have been working on a game for a while now, and this would have really helped. I could never get collisions to work. Yeah. Well, this isn't collision exactly. This is uh, this is people trying to figure out if they're going to get run over, right? Like, um, you know, because uh, you, you don't want them reacting to cars just driving down the street. But like, if if you steer off the road and steer right at them, then th they need to be like, oh damn, because it it looks really weird when they don't react and you just plow right through them, you know. And so uh, I, the sensitivity has turned up too high in Cyberpunk. Um, in Grand Theft Auto, there's also an issue where people just, they, they literally dive in Grand Theft Auto. They'll dive and slide on their stomach, you know, to get out of the way of the car, which most pedestrians don't do that. You know, they'll just kind of like, oh, you know. Uh... If, if you've played any of those kinds of games, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. Okay. So these things are your, your, your tools like hammer and saws and things like that. These, these linear algebra things are, um, these are, these are your tools, length, normalized dot product, cross product. Um, 
and then and then you then you start learning algorithms and things like that, which um, allow you to do really interesting stuff as well. So uh, I was studying convex holes last night. We'll probably do that in the future. It's gone, Brim. Um, and uh, so within negative one through one, it's how you script those reactions. Um, yeah. So the 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 results from these two functions are all between negative one and positive one, but they just mean different things. Uh, the the cross product is just ninety degrees from the dot product, and so um, you just look at the. Um, what I would do is I just put it into a blueprint, and then as I'm driving around, just have all the pedestrians just like printing out how far they are away and the the cross product, and just um, kind of eyeballing it. You know, just spawn one pedestrian on the street, drive around, and kind of look at the numbers and be like, okay. Less than 0.21, that feels about right to me. And that means they're, you know, whatever the inverse cosine or the inverse sine is of that. Uh, 0.21, uh, I'm in programmer mode. 0.21 inverse sine. So within like a 12 degree, or yeah, 12 degree, am I in degrees? Yeah. Within like a 12 degree arc, one way or the other. So a 24 degree arc. So if, if you're coming like pretty close at them, then they should freak out. Does that make sense? And, and so usually all these things are, are judgment calls and the CD project red people made the wrong judgment call on it, frankly. If you're on a motorcycle and you back it up at like one inch a second, all the pedestrians are going to go, oh my gosh, he's trying to murder us. And they all start f fleeing. You're just like, you're on a motorcycle just backing it up with your feet. And everyone freaks out. It's it's a very badly designed system. Okay, um, so so you can use this to determine if something is to the right or to the left of something. That's usually what you use cross product for, um, or if they're close to pointing in the same direction. And uh, yeah, okay. So um, I'm sure, Cyberpunk will be great in three years. I mean, honestly, by the end of this year, it should be playable. I, I wouldn't buy it at this point. Like, if you haven't bought Cyberpunk by now, like, I wouldn't. I would wait on it. It's not worth 60 bucks for sure. Okay, so, 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 let's talk about your homework assignment. So, your first homework assignment is going to be doing uh, what's called a Veroni diagram. So, let me see what we got here. Veroni 2. Um, I think the one I did last year was a little bit too easy, so let me uh, let me delete the uh, starter code I gave out. There, I deleted out eight lines of code. Okay. So uh, you guys are going to have to do two algorithms by this time next Friday, and they're really easy. It, it's not it's not a hard assignment to do, um, but uh, uh, No Man's Sky in four years it's good. Yeah. Um, so the first algorithm you're going to have to do is called Veroni, and the second algorithm you're going to have to do is called Lloyd's. And so what the hell are those things? They sound really complicated. Okay. Let me let me show you the let me show you the Veroni algorithm first. Okay. So a very common thing that we do in video games is determine what points are... Uh, so given a set of points, find all points that are closest to that point. So do you see all those colored points there? So these are cities, right? D, I, Jerusalem, Canada. I don't know. Canada's not really a city. And so Carthage, sorry. And so it starts off by randomly placing cities on a map. It starts off by randomly placing cities on a map, and then it it for every cell, for every space on the map, it determines which city is closest to it. And so this is going to be that for loop that I just showed you, where you're going to go through every point on the map, on the grid, and then go through every city and take a distance. And whichever city has the lowest distance, 
that's the city that owns that tile. So all of these uh, tiles here are owned by Carthage. And all of these are owned by Jerusalem. All of these are owned by whatever it is, Nebraska, I don't know. And, uh, and this is basically making a random map, right? So it'll scatter cities on it there. And it, we got a random map. And do it again. And it makes a random map. And do it again. And it makes a random map. You guys understand? So, um, do you have years from last semester? I don't know. Uh, I, I mean, I didn't preserve it. Um, and so anyway, we're not, we're not just doing that one Walker. We're going to do Lloyd's algorithm as well. Um, cause I know some people did the first part last semester. And so for this assignment, um, there's a lot of starter code, like the code to print the world is already done for you. So you don't have to worry about how to print colors inside of putty or any of that kind of stuff. Um, it's, it's, mostly done for you. <clears throat> the code you have to write is the code that goes through every tile and takes the distance to every city and whichever city is the smallest, set that city to be the owner of the tile. So it's an order in, I don't know, number of tiles times the number of cities is the order of the algorithm. Okay. And so it makes this cool little random map and you can use this to generate maps if you want. Um, <clears throat> cobblestones are oftentimes made using Veroni diagrams. And so if you want to randomly generate cobblestones, then you scatter these seed points across the surface. And then every point that is closer to that seed than another seed gets added to that cobblestone. And so you'll have some small cobblestones, you'll have some big cobblestones, and it creates this nice, interesting pattern. <clears throat> but you might notice these things are like kind of weirdly shaped for cobblestones. So that's part two of your assignment. Part two of your assignment is to do what's called a, a relaxation or a Lloyd relaxation. Um, <clears throat> so so we generate a random map and then it says, do you want to do a Veroni relaxation? It's called Lloyd's algorithm. And so <clears throat> what that algorithm is is for each, for each country, for every country, here's Carthage, for every country, what you do is you average the X and Ys in it. So for every tile, for every tile in Carthage, you add the X and the Y coordinates together, and then you divide by the number of tiles. So you take the average X and the average Y. So for every tile in Carthage, for every tile in Carthage, you average their X values together you average their y values together and that gives you the center point that gives you the centroid the center point of that country okay so for lloyd's algorithm you average you find the average x and the average y and you set the city to be you move the city you move carthage to be the center point of the country that it's in and then you rerun veroni so watch what happens so c watch watch where c moves c is going to move like probably around here somewhere. And then it reruns the algorithm again. See that? So C jumped down here, and then it reran the Veroni region. And what that has the effect of doing is that it smooths out these weird looking um, countries. So like if you do some of these, you get these really long, like um, narrow, oftentimes countries, they, they have this really kind of weird look to them. You see that? Like this weird strip of, of land. And so if you do a Veroni relaxation, then what happens is it tends to round them. So you see that M moved up here and it has kind of a more natural round shape to it. And if you keep doing this, if you keep doing it, watch M, watch M. You see how everything sort of starts becoming very homogenous. You see that? Keep running it over and over again. Everything kind of turns into a samey, a very samey, almost boring map, right? So if you do it enough times, like all the countries kind of even out over time and you just get all these kind of boring maps. So, you know, this looks a little weird. You've got two cities right next to each other, right? And so everything on that side is Florence and everything on that side is Johannesburg or something. And then if you do a Veroni relaxation, watch. Florence is going to move down here. Johannesburg is going to move down here. And their countries um, become more rounded. 
right? And so usually one Veroni relaxation is enough to get rid of those weird strips of land and things like that. Uh, if you do it too many times, though, then you'll see the countries all just turn into Nebraska, <laughs> right? This is like the Great West, the Great Plains states of the Midwest, right? You got North Dakota and South Dakota and Utah and, you know, yeah. except they're vertically lined up instead of horizontally lined up, right? Okay, uh, turns the East Coast into the West Coast. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that's, that's your assignment. And uh, word count... Um, and let's see. So mine's 205 lines of code. Let's see what the starter code is. Uh, word count, name.cc, 179. So the actual assignment is 25 lines of code. So there's 180 lines of starter code that'll do things like read the cities and put them on the map and um, colors and all that kind of stuff. You have to write 25 lines of code by next Friday. So, um, I think that's pretty reasonable. Um, if you've never coded before Rosenberg, then work with Muya on yours. Um, so let me just go through this code. Um, wait, it's all Ohio. <laughs> it always has been. Let me just go through this code and I'll explain it to you so you understand the starter code. A little bit and then we'll call it a day um oh uh one thing everybody needs to do everybody needs to make sure you have uh unreal engine installed latest version so if you haven't gone through that process yet if you don't have a windows machine you need a windows machine place a request with the library they have um they don't have gaming laptops but they have kind of better and worse laptops and the better ones they'll, they'll loan out to you guys if you need a windows machine so um Make sure you install. Um, make sure you install Unreal Engine here. Unreal Epic Games Launcher, Unreal Engine. All the instructions are on Canvas library, and then install 4.26. It's the latest version. Um, install Steam. Add me on Steam if you haven't already. And then you guys are gonna uh, have to play a board game. We're gonna do a little bit more talk about. Um, game elements, principles of game design and things like that. So get into a group of people here in IS50B and play uh, play some board games with people. So go on to Tabletop Simulator, play some games, uh, have some fun. So you've got one programming assignment by next Friday and I'm going to overwhelm you with homework by making you play a game with your friends. Um, Prado's in a group already with the IS50A people, that's fine. You can form a you can form a group with them for these for these games if you want. Um, play War Chest, yeah, that's a cool game. That's a cool game. Um, do you need to get another group? No, Prado, Prado, you're in it. You're in a group. That's fine. Uh, Shaney is in uh, CSI 41. Shaney, if you want to play board games and video games, let me know. You can you can join in. I don't really care. I've got kind of an open door policy on guests. I basically allow anybody who wants to learn to learn. You know, so. Uh, yeah, so if you guys just chat on the groups, form groups of four or so, and uh, that, that'll that just be for now for playing video games and stuff like that. Um, okay, so let's, so there's that. Do you guys understand? You gotta play, you gotta play board game by next Friday? You, you guys cool with that? Mancarelli is in 50A, so he knows. Uh, all right, you got you to gotta play a video game. This is, I'm a very strict teacher. You got to play games. Okay. Uh, all right, so, uh, yeah, so let's go through the starter code here just so you kind of understand what's going on. This header file here is my header file for reading uh, input. It's a, a better way of doing things than CNing things, to be perfectly honest. Uh, this is my header file that I've made for doing color. It, it actually supports 24-bit color to the screen in putty so you can actually render you know 4k full color images inside of putty if you if you want to and that that is that library there the um uh vector sealants that's all the normal stuff 
So uh, this, I don't know if you guys have seen this before, but uh, there's a preprocessor directive that will cause your code to not compile. And so I've got a preprocessor directive here, and this is kind of obscure stuff that a lot of people have never seen before. Uh, you can actually check to see what version of C++ you're currently in. And so my code is saying, if your version of C++ is less than 2017, then don't compile. And it'll print an error message to the screen instead. This code requires C++ 17 and above. Sucks to be you. So if you try compiling with the old, older version of C++, it won't work. Okay. And then I've got uh, type aliases set up. I typically do this for most of my projects. Um, signed 8-bit, signed 16-bit, signed 32-bit, signed 64-bit, unsigned 8-bit, unsigned 16-bit, unsigned 32-bit, unsigned 64-bit. And the more C++ y way of doing that is to use using, this is the modern way of doing it. Uh, type def is the C way of doing it. Equals U and 64. So, <clears throat> U and. And so uh, this line and this line do the exact same thing. They create an alias, a type alias. Because I don't like typing these long types. So I usually alias them down to something manageable. Okay. Uh, so there is a tile class. The tile class is used to hold information about every square in the world. And a lot of games use tile-based worlds. Not all of them. Like first-person shooters aren't based on tiles. But like Diablo, uh, Diablo 2 are on tiles. Uh, Age of Empires is on tiles. And what, what, what that means is that the world is a giant 2D array. It's a giant 2D array. And every tile has information about what's within that area of the world. So for example, there's a forest here. There's water here. There's water here with a fishing boat on it. There's water here with a fishing boat on it and a fishing net. Okay. There's a gold supply here. It has 500 gold remaining. So Age of Empires, every square on the map has information about what's in that square. And when you order object, when you order units to move, they will use the tile information to pathfind from one place to another. If you right-click on a tile and it's got an enemy unit on it, then it gives a command for one unit to attack another unit. That's how a lot of RTSs work. They have tiles. And that's what you're going to be doing for this assignment. So you are going to... Uh, every tile has a row and a column that it's in. Uh, however, we don't need to actually save that because it's going to be in a data structure. It's going to be in a 2D array, a 2D vector. And so whatever row you're in inside of the, the world here, whatever column you're in within the world here is your location. And so um, you don't need to save that separately. Just when you access that tile, you know where, where it is. So you don't need to save it separately. How dare you want us to have fun? I know, and I'm, a, I'm a miserable professor. I just want students to play games and talk about games and rip on cyberpunk and anthem. <laughs> and so, um, so wait, what did you say about a board game? You have to form a group and you have to play board games in a group by next Friday. So, um, tabletop simulator on steam is a mandatory, is a mandatory purchase for this class. That's your textbook. So TTS. So you're going to go on to tabletop simulator and run it. And with your group, you're going to play a board game. So if you want to find a board game, you can go to Workshop here. Uh, Workshop uh, has all sorts of games. Tainted Grail, Fall of Avalon. Avalon. Sports one to four players. Looks pretty cool. Looks pretty cool. Uh, da, 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 da. Subscribe to that. Okay. And then uh, when you launch the game, you can go into multiplayer, create multiplayer, friends only, create server. And uh, there it is, Tainted Grail Fall of Avalon. So you click on that, hit load, and it will create a virtual tabletop. Normally when I run this class, we play board games in person. Uh, Harlan brought in War Chest, which is a pretty awesome two-player strategy board game. Oh, it's still downloading. All right, well, 
back out of that then. We'll let that, we'll let that download. Um, and, uh, and then your friends will join in on you and you can move the pieces around and flip cards and things like that. So it, uh, uh, it's gotta be a board game though, not Diablo 2, Harlan. For, for now we're just doing board games because board games, um, isolate game mechanics. So, um, sad. You can play video games later. <laughs> Is Gloomhaven super awesome? Yeah, let me pull up Gloomhaven for you. Um, Gloomhaven is the highest ranked, or it was at least for a while, the highest ranked board game on Board Game Geek, and rightfully so. It it it's really a monumental achievement. I'm I'm actually not fond of playing it because the um, the reality of the situation is setting it up and tearing it down takes forever. So. Um, like if I were to like want to play Gloomhaven, uh, is it not on here? Yeah. Damn. Uh, I thought I had it. Uh... Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah. Um, that every time I think about playing it, it's like, oh man, it's going to take an hour to get all the pieces set up and. Like really what you want to do is just leave it set up and just have a card table in your house and you just come back to it to play. To finish the game takes about 200 hours. It's um, it's basically a Dungeons and Dragons campaign in a box. It's a board game and you go on missions, but the missions have certain dungeons. So you have to fish out the dungeon tiles and assemble the dungeon. You put monsters on it in certain places and the team comes together and runs through the dungeon and depending on how well you do, you get different results. There's role-playing encounters. If you agree to help this guy, you get one thing. If you kill them, you get another thing. And um, it's like, all right, you killed the guy, add this random event to the, the card deck. And then when you randomly draw an event, like his friend, his friends come back to try and murder you. You know, it's it, it, it does just this amazing job at um, actually simulating a D&D experience without needing a dungeon master. So it's, it's a cool cool game um it's a cool game that i kind of hate to play because just it's like if you're gonna play it like just block off the entire day and just run through three or four scenarios you know uh, there's different classes you unlock different classes over time uh there's a board of the world map that changes over time you put stickers on it as you discover new dungeons you put stickers on it and those are explored sites that you can visit. When you go there, you open the rule book, and uh, you open the rule book, and you flip to page fifty-four, and you set up the dungeon and put the monsters on it. And um, yeah, it's it's one of the best games that I don't like playing. <laughs> it's, um, I I wouldn't recommend playing that with your group unless like it's you know unless it's like your your cup of tea, I guess. Uh, games that I would I would get into would be like um, good games for like a group of four domains easy to learn diplomacies a few that's going to be like a four or five hour process we did that last year mage knights some of the most complicated games ever if you like complicated games that are really well designed but complicated mage knights really good um, through the ages is not that bad to learn and it's a well made game maybe that one um, I've been eager to play Dune Imperium. It's been very well received. I haven't played it yet. Um, that's a 12-hour game. I wouldn't play that. Troys, I like Troys a lot. Um, but anyhow, don't don't play don't play simple games. Don't play like um, checkers or whatever. No 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 Chinese checkers. No. Poker. I, I want you to play an interesting game. Okay. War of the Ring is a two-player game uh, that is also every person I know that's played it sings its praises. They say it's an amazing game. Uh, it also takes hours and hours to play. So I've never played it though, but I've heard a lot of really good things about it. I've, I've watched people play it, but I've never played it myself. No Uno, no Dominoes. Uh, D two is D two is a good game. Diablo two is a good game, but we're doing board games right now. So, uh, uh, 
you don't like ogre yeah ogre is an interesting game but yeah there's a lot of a lot of pieces and stuff okay um play the game for an hour without flipping the table <laughs> yeah. yesterday's lecture has not been posted right yeah so i recorded a lecture yesterday and the audio didn't work so i've got to, i've got to re-record the lecture for yesterday so sorry about that ida you want to know what you missed um so we went over the principles of game design uh, you're going to need to get into a group, and uh, you can post onto the Discord if you need a group, or some of these people are probably forming a group right now if you'd like to play board games with them. And uh, uh, basically, you just got to play a board game. Uh, so go on to Tabletop Simulator. It's what I got streaming right now if you're watching that. And so you're just going to go on to Tabletop Simulator and just play a board, board, board game with your new friends. And then there's a link on uh, Canvas to the uh, place where you submit your, your answers. And you basically analyze you analyze the game. You look at the different components of game design. How interactive is it? How much downtime there is? Things like that. Okay. And so I'll, I'll re-record that lecture. I had to re-record the 45 lecture yesterday also. Um, I play a game called Rocksmith. And so the USB audio input on Rocksmith counts as a microphone. Guess what? It was recording for my electric guitar. It was not recording me for four and a half hours of lecture yesterday. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I checked the audio input today before I recorded. Okay, so, um, so Ida, you, you, you understand, Ada, Ida? It's my daughter's name, by the way, ADA, though. How many sick riffs did it pick up? None, because it was just sitting behind me, you know, like, that would be funny, though, if I just, you know, you just hear guitar when I'm lecturing. Can't believe the audio engineers designed the game with the worst audio engineering. Yeah, there's there's issues, but um, I, I really dig it. I think it's I think it's I wish it would come out with a new one, you know, that does guitar, bass, drums, but mic, you know, that has audio tracks, drum tracks, that teaches you how to play all of the keyboard, that teaches you how to be a musician in a rock band. Like that would be the ultimate the ultimate game. Okay, um, yeah, so let's go back to the code, I guess. So that's the world. It's a 2D array, and there's a 2D array that's like whatever the size of your screen is. So however big your putty screen is, that's how many tiles it's going to create. And, um, and so um, it's going to scatter cities randomly across the map. So you can see the constructor for the city class here. It uh, randomly picks a color. And then um, the cities have a row and column that I guess randomly get made somewhere else. So city list is the list of all cities in the world, and tile or, or uh, world is the list of all tiles in the world. And so the algorithm, the algorithm you have to write is for each tile in the world, set its owner, set its owner to be the index of the city from city list. That is closest to it. So you're going to use the Pythagorean theorem over and over again at every tile. You're going to Pythagorean theorem my location to the city's location, my location to this city's location, my location to that city's location. And whichever city is closest, that's the one you're going to color, or that's the one you're going to set the owner to be, the index and city list here. Okay? And so it's a, it's a map generator. It's a simple map generator. And hopefully that's fun for you. Um, rows and columns is a global that holds how many rows are in the world, how many columns are in the world. These are globals. They're initialized to zero, by the way. Did you guys know that? Globals are initialized to zero. It's true. It's true. All right. Uh, I will see you, Muya. Uh, but that's what you, what you got to do. Okay. Um, I'm just finish going over this for everyone else. You don't need to modify this. Um, this just reads all the cities in and randomly randomly places cities on the map. That's fine. You don't need to worry about that. Um, print world prints that map of the world. So that does all the colors for you. Again, you don't need to worry about that either. You can look at it, you know, if you want to admire my code. <laughs> for every row in the world, for every column in the world, um, the owner of that tile is that tile's owner. The uh, content which is like, does it have a tree on it? Does it have water on it? Um, right now, all it holds are the letters of the cities. The content of that is the tiles content. 
If uh, content is zero, then it becomes a space. If there's no owner, it draws black. So if any cities are unclaimed, it draws black. At the beginning of the world, none of the tiles are claimed. So it draws black first, right? It, well, it draws black with the cities on it, then it colors them in. So at the beginning, it doesn't draw any, any, uh, any countries. Uh, otherwise, it grabs the owner of the tile and sets the color to be the city's color. Every city is randomly given a color and um, then it outputs it. Okay, so it changes the color to be the color city and then it okay. Actually, prints I it meant, to the screen. I just meant, I meant five orcs and all of Skyrim and killed all, and killed four. Why are you killing my people, Ada? Okay, okay, that one was a bandit leader. <laughs> that guy was a bandit leader. That guy was a bandit leader, the other one was a bandit, and then one was a drug dealer, and the other one started attacking me. Well, all four attacked me. Okay, so globals are initial, they're, they're always zero initialized. Okay. Ents, doubles, floats, if they're a global, they're always uh, zero initialized. True story. Most people don't know that, though. Most people think those are uninitialized variables. But uh, the reason for that is because globals are stored in the BSS, and the BSS is zero, zero filled at the beginning. And so globals can actually are guaranteed by the standard to be zero at launch. Um, stack variables, though, are not. And the reason for that is because they don't want to zero. Every time you do a function, they don't want to have to zero the memory. Yeah. True story. True story. So print world. Uh, that's how you can do colors. That function there will set the color of the output. And then it's going to print probably just usually a space. So it prints a space with the background color set to the city's color, and that's what makes the map colorful. Uh, here is the Veroni algorithm. You're given most of it with this chunk um, pulled out. You find the nearest city, find the nearest city. That's the Veroni algorithm, okay? So for every tile, for every row, for every column, uh, you go through every city, you do the Pythagorean um, formula, the hypot function. Um, for every city, find the closest one. Uh, get the distance. If that distance is less than that number, it's, you know, that's the new nearest one and remember which one it was. And then at the end of the loop, you're gonna set the owner to be near a city. And um, and that's it, that's Roni. So that's about five lines of code here, maybe something like that. And then for the Lloyd's algorithm for the Roni relaxation, you're gonna go, you're gonna do this loop again, uh, basically for every, uh, yeah. So, so basically you're gonna iterate across the whole world and you're gonna add up all the X coordinates for each country all the Y coordinates for each country and set that city's location to be the average X location and the average Y location. So you're summing up all the X coordinates, summing up all the Y coordinates for Carthage and then dividing by the size. The size is actually, you know that, I'm keeping track of it for you. So that's about 10, 15 lines of code, I don't know, somewhere around there. Okay. So that is that. Is that. That's what you guys got to do by next Friday. So you got to play one board game. Twilight Imperium would be awesome. Uh, it's another long game. I actually really like long games. I'm actually going to be busy this weekend. Otherwise, I'd play with you. Um, but yeah, you got to play a board game. And then you got to write that code right there. And write that code right there. Okay. You guys cool with that? You, you all understand? This one says who the biggest city is. Main uh, randomly generates the world somewhere. Let's see. That loads the world, then it prints the world, it pauses for a second, it does the Veroni, and prints the world again. So that's why it shows the cities on the screen for a second, and then it fills them in with the, the color. Okay. 
Um, that is C++ 17. This is why it requires C++ 17, by the way. Um, so get terminal size returns a struct that has the number of rows, the number of rows and the number of columns. So if you've never seen this syntax before, that's C++ 17. And so what this is saying is grab the rows and put it into temp rows, grab the number of columns and put them into temp columns, and then it copies those into the globals. So that's called structured binding. So it's a way that you don't need to make a struct. You can just um, copy the values of a struct out into regular variables, which is kind of cool. You don't need to do it. It's kind of cool. You like that, Brig? Structured bindings? It's kind of cool. Put square brackets on the left-hand side, which is a weird a weird notion. Um, the, the way that you do that before is you would do um, uh, struct. Uh, I don't know what type it is. What type is get terminal size? Get terminal size. It returns a pair. OK. It returns a pair of integers. All right. So you would say a pair of int int uh whatever whatever equals get terminal size and then you'd say rows equals whatever dot first calls equals whatever dot second so this code here these three lines of code here are the same thing as these three lines of code here and a half. I used a comma operator. So um, the, the reason to do this is this actually just makes a variable, you know, um, so you don't have to have a struct and then pull things out of a struct. You can just pull things out directly. Okay, so um, C C plus plus and this is how we do it. Okay. Right. Right, so Veroni two is in your directories, and uh, next week we will continue our exploration of the vector, uh, what I call it, linear, linear. Next week, we'll continue our exploration of uh, the linear algebra toolbox that allows us to do cool things in video games. And you will get another uh, cool, fun little um, math programming assignment, I guess you'd call it. But really, these things are just so useful in so many different areas of game programming that, you know, they have complicated names like Dirichet domains and Veroni and relaxations and all this kind of stuff. But really, all you're doing is just finding whichever point's close you're, you're closest to. That's it. So, um, cross product and dot product. I know there's a lot of vocab, um, and I'm not really a big fan of jargon at all. But uh, these things are really useful to know, and you can do you can do stuff with them. You can do a lot of cool stuff. With them. So that is it for today, guys. Uh, sorry we ran 10 minutes over. Uh, it was a little bit late because I was sorting out 41. So I'll, I'll try to get 41 ending a little bit earlier in the future. Then we can get going. Because there's a little pause in between my broadcasting setup. Okay, so uh, yeah. If you guys group up. Um, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll put all these assignments up on Canvas and stuff. All right. I'll see you guys.